الجزء الثالث والاخير من مؤتمر فري كونكتد مايندز بيتعلق بموضوع الحريه اللي بلشنا نحكي عنه بالجلسه اللي قطعت جلسه النقاش الاولى بهيدا الجزء بتعالج موضوع الامن مقابل الحريه على الانترنت سايبر سيكيورتي فيرسس سايبر فريدم يدير النقاش مؤسس ونائب رئيس انترنت سوسايتي ايزو كلبنون شابتر الاستاذ جابرييل ديك تفضل ما بعرف ليش على دوري بدي احكي بالانجليزي كلكم عم تحكوا عربي وكلكم بدكم تعملوا ثورات بس بدي استغني من الفرصه اذا بتريدي ست ماي بدي استغني من الفرصه واقول انه اخر ثوره انا بعرفها هي الثوره البولشيفيه وكانت انقلاب وما في ثورات الا هي انقلابات بالحقيقه و... وما حيصير في ثوره لا عنا ولا عند غيرنا الا بانقلاب ومن بعد الانقلاب بده يصير في ديمقراطيه غير هيك ما فينا مش حفينا نتقدم وكله هيدا تويتر فيسبوك الى اخره كله آه عم نسبح بالفضاء آه الافتراضي ومش حنقدر نوصل فيه الا فقط فقط لتنوير بعض يعني الافكار وتبلور بعض الاراء واعطاء بعض الامل لبعض الاشخاص اللي هن مغمورين ووضعهم ما يقوس منه مثل حالتنا نحن. بقى ما كثير يعني ما كثير مش رح استفيد لاني عم زعبر هلا انا ما عم بعلق على على السيشن بس ما بعرف ليش نحن اخر سيشن نحن قبل اخر سيشن اي قالت اخر سيشن Okay, so hello everybody. Let me welcome you to the cyber security versus cyber freedom session, during which we will discuss government surveillance and data protection. And for that purpose, I would like to invite our distinguished panelists, Dr. Hans Jürgen Gastka. Where are you? Mr. Luigi Gambardella. Luigi. And Mr. Nate Cardozo. Nate. Dr. Gartska is a reputed, uh, reputed academic and a former data protection advisor for the German government. Mr. Gambardella is the chairman of ETNO, the European Telecom Network Operators Association, representing a very powerful sector in Europe and uh, in the whole world, by the way. Mr. Cardozo is a lawyer in uh, San Francisco, California. He is a staff attorney at the Electronic Frontier Foundation, yeah. an NGO aiming at defending digital civil liberties. Okay. Is the government spying on us? Does the government have the right to spy on us? No. On no. some of us. Yeah. OK. What are the limits between security and freedom? Great question. Are people like Julian Assange and William Snowden heroes or traitors? Traitors. <laughs> I'm hoping to answer those questions and much more during our session. And for that purpose, I would like to welcome Dr. Garstka, who is going to make a quick review, you promised me, a quick review, three slides, on the history of data protection. So the microphone is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Can I, can I have the first slide? Yes. <clears throat> now we have a, a difficult part uh, in, our, in our day, because now we come from the very expressive discussion about uh, the dissemination of information, about the imparting of information, of political information, to another side of the problem. What is about the use of the information which is in the world? And that uh, is uh, the topic of our discussion, I think, now. And I think it would be helpful uh, to have some, uh, some very, very short remarks uh, to, the, to the staff about which we discuss now. And so we have to start, I think, uh, to, look, to have a look to the relations uh, which are important in the information society uh, in respect of our discussion. Uh, I want to different, differentiate four elements. On the left-hand side, the state, 
uh, and the business. And we have to differentiate this during our discussion in the morning already uh, sometimes that is mixed up. Problems which we have with uh, the use of data in the business are maybe the same as the state. We have the surveillance problem on both sides and so on. But I think we have uh, to differentiate. And on the other side are the citizens on behalf of the state and the customers uh, concerning business. Both uh, players on the left-hand side have different objections. The objective of the state is, I think in our discussion, to protect the citizen, to protect it from uh, dangers, to protect it from crime, and so on. Uh, the interests of business differently uh, different. Uh, the business of uh, the interest of business is advertising for customers. But what connects uh, all these elements is that they collect data on the other part. The state about citizens, business about customers, and even the state, that would be the left-hand side, the state uh, on business. Can I have the next slide? If we see the problem from the other side, we have rights uh, of the citizens against the state, rights of the business against uh, of the customers sorry, against uh, the business and these rights are very similar the one side of the problem is that citizens have rights against the state on how we call that in germany information self determination that means every citizen has to decide he or herself what should uh, be done with the data about him or her, which are in the world, other wording is data protection, or the traditional wording for this problem is privacy from the beginning. On the other side, we have uh, the rights uh, to know uh, what the other side has uh, as data, the problem of access to information, the problem of freedom inf of information. Uh, on both, in both areas, in both different areas, we have worldwide a uh, big field of legislation. On the one hand side, we have data protection legislation, uh, which rules uh, which data can be, uh, can, can be collected uh, by the state, uh, by the business. On the one hand side, some dozens of states in the world have such uh, legislation. On the other side, uh, too, we have legislation on freedom of information, uh, which rules uh, the access of uh, citizens and customers to data held by states and business. Uh, on the other side, uh, nearly we have 100 states in the world which have such um, um, legislation. And if we discuss our problem, even security and freedom, we have to have in our mind uh, this wide, wide field of regulation we have. Now can I have the last slide? Uh, I concentrate now on uh, data protection uh, on uh, privacy. Which principles rule uh, this form of leg legislation? And I think that will lead to the real uh, items we have to discuss now. Uh, the principle uh, from my side and from the side from most legislation is what we, I told that uh, already, in Germany called information self-determination. Everybody has to decide him or herself uh, which data uh, are to be collected, which data have to be disclosed uh, to others. Uh, that uh, means the priority of consent. And that's the principle of all data protection legislation in the world. The pri prior primary uh, uh, principle of collecting of data, of processing data, of uh, disclosing data is the consent of the concerned people. Of course, that's not possible uh, in, in many areas of our society. That means uh, we must have a legal basis also for collecting, processing, and so on of data without consent. And which are the principles there? And then we are in the kernel of our discussions. Of course, uh, the state has public duties, especially, uh, especially to assure security, to fight against criminal prosecution. What is necessary for this duty must be allowed for the state, for the prosecution uh, agencies, uh, and for other agencies, even for intelligence uh, agencies. 
Uh, on the other side, in the private sector, not so important here, uh, the data which are necessary to perform a contract are, have to be allowed to uh, process. To the main restriction, but, uh, of all that is the, princess, uh, the uh, principle of necessity. And I think that's a very important uh, principle, very important idea. Only those data are necessary for performance of duties, for example, are allowed uh, to be processed, are allowed to be collected, processed, uh, disclosed. And the most important part element of necessity, that is proportionality. That means uh, the uh, data, the intrusion caused by uh, processing of data must be in a real proportion, in an adequate proportion to the reason, to the purpose data are, have been collected uh, and uh, operated, uh, processed. And if we discuss, uh, for example, the NSA uh, affairs uh, in the last months, we have to see on the one hand side uh, the American intelligence agencies have a legal basis for collecting data. In the Patriot Act and APIS Act, they have a legal basis. Well, but we, we, we are going to challenge this, so let, uh, allow me just to ask, if, excuse me, uh, 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 just uh, allow me to ask uh, Luigi mm -hmm. about... Half, half a sentence, half a sentence. Half a sentence. Half a sentence. Half a sentence. Okay. Yes, the main restriction means proportionality. Uh, these American institutions and institu institutions in other countries, they have a legal basis, but they don't uh, accept the principle of pro proportionality. That means they make more than they are allowed to. They are in principle allowed, but they, they make much, much more than is necessary. And that's the kernel, I think, of our discussion. Okay, great. Thank you, Dr. Gastka. Uh, Luigi, can I ask you for a comment on all this? I'm sure you have you know, your own opinion. We discussed this over lunch. Uh, what about information self-determination? And what about you know, the importance of privacy, especially that you are coming from the private sector? Yes, first of all, uh, uh, let me start. I would like to thank uh, really uh, uh, May Chad Foundation and the, and the president of the foundation and uh, uh, my friends uh, that are here, Lebanese friends, for having invited me. And uh, I, I feel that it is a privilege for me to be here with you and to participate in such prestigious and important event in such beautiful city and country. Uh, but uh, let me uh, try to uh, be a little bit uh, challenged. And I would like, I know that has been extremely interesting the conversation that we have had today, in particular the part that has been focused rightly on the importance of the freedom, of the speech, and the human rights. But we should, uh, uh, don't forget, have in mind the economic value of this sector. Um, just, I give you just one figure, I will, you immediately realize the importance. According to Boston Consulting Group, uh, the value, I'm referring only extracted, only from European consumers' personal data, uh, were worth in 2011 350 billion euro. And the potential to grow is nearly 1 trillion euro per year annually in 2020. There are companies the company that you mentioned that are here uh, on, on my back, their value depends on the way they can collect data and the way how they can use this information. If you change the rules, change the value of these companies. And these companies, uh, there are a few companies that have the value of entire stock market of a big country, the five big uh, 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 big uh, over the top, yes, over the top, uh, top together have the value bigger than the stock market of Brazil, and I can make other examples. So let me uh, uh, remember you that here, as has been rightly said uh, by the professor, there are two important aspects, and we should discuss both together. There is the aspect of uh, the human rights, 
the freedom, the speech, and then there is the commercial aspects. And we have to be very careful, and I, I fully agree with you, we were discussing during the lunch, not to mix up the two things. And there are a lot of economic interests behind uh, uh, the legislation of, of privacy data protection. Imagine that we, have had, we, have had, we are having in Brussels uh, uh, the discussion on the new regulation and directive for data protection. I think it has been presented 3,000 amendments. Uh, I think that has been the, 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 the matter who has involved more lobbyists. I don't know how much company have spent in order to follow this change. Just to give you. But let me also uh, give you some elements, and I would like to, uh, I think that it's important to understand, uh, uh, and maybe I um, add some points uh, respect to my previous, uh, the, the previous intervention. In Europe, uh, uh, the pri privacy is a fundamental human right. It's a human right. It's in our constitution. And uh, this is important because in, in the US, for example, it's not, it's not a, a, a constitutional principle. It's just uh, uh, something that they have to follow because it's a protection of the consumer protection. So it has a completely different level of protection. And we have in Europe a second right that is very important as well, that is the data protection. So it means the way the data, the data are protected by who, uh, uh, who has uh, 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 this data. So uh, uh, starting from this, uh, we know how many changes we are seeing uh, since uh, the directive was in uh, 1995 and then in 2002, many, many technological changes. If I may say, we badly, uh, uh, when we think about the privacy data protection, we think only about, only about our smartphone. But let's think about Internet of Things. Let's think about uh, uh, cloud services. Let, let's think about the connections that will be uh, and will allow to increase the possibility to collect every kind of information, everything, everything we do, not only because of, the, of our telephone or the internet. So, uh, for this reason, uh, you know that uh, we are discussing in Europe uh, uh, a reform of the data protection. And what are uh, uh, basically what, what, what we want, what we, are, we would like to achieve? from this uh, re reform. First of all, there are two important new rights that we are introducing in Europe with this reform. The first right is, is uh, the so-called right to be forgotten. You know that uh, sometimes uh, when we put the information on certain kind of service that it's practically impossible to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, erase this data. And this is a, very important, uh, is a very important right. And another one which will be introduced in Europe is the right to data portability. So it means that you can transfer the data that you have from one provider to another provider. <coughs> uh, um, obviously, what, uh, what we should uh, try uh, uh, to achieve uh, from uh, this reform First of all, there is, we need to find the right balance between what? The fact that we have to protect the consumer. Because, as I said, it's in our constitution. We have no choice in Europe. We have to do that. But at the same time, we should uh, avoid the risk not to allow to have new services in Europe because these services are needed and our customers are asking for these services. What, uh, uh, if I may try in three, in three uh, simple way, what are three important elements of this reform? Okay, uh, can, I, can I give you... Yes. Be, I would like to listen a little bit to Nate, you know, giving his opinion about the limits between freedom and security. And then we'll go back to you, Luigi, about your three points. Sure. Um, well, thank you very much. Uh, just to give you some background on who I am, uh, because I think it'll inform what I'm about to say. I'm obviously an American lawyer. I work in San Francisco for the Electronic Frontier Foundation. 
Uh, we are a civil liberties organization. We fight against the surveillance state. Uh, we started suing the NSA in 2008, and that suit is still uh, ongoing and has been strengthened significantly uh, after Edward Snowden. So that'll give you some background on where I'm coming from. Uh, I take issue with the uh, freedom versus security dichotomy that, that is the basis for this panel. I, I think it's a false dichotomy. Uh, I think we not only can we have both security and freedom, we need them both, and we need freedom to have security. Uh, I, I think there are some other distinctions that, that we can draw, and I, I think that all three of us here are in agreement on at least the first. Uh, the, the first is there are two very different meanings of the word privacy when we're talking about privacy online. There's privacy between you and the state, and there's privacy between you and private companies, uh, between you and Facebook and between you and Google. And those are very different types of privacy. Uh, if Google knows everything about me, that's great, they can show me ads. If the state knows everything about me uh, and they don't like it, they can throw me in jail. The worst that Google can do is not show me ads. The worst that the state can do is violence and incarceration. Um, there are two types of security that we can talk about. There are, there's the security of the state itself and there's the security of the citizens within the state. So I think when we're talking about cybersecurity uh, versus cyber freedom, we need to be very careful about what type of security we're talking about. Are we talking about our physical security from violence or are we talking about the security of the state perpetuating itself? Um, and then finally, uh, and this, th this last one is only really applicable to privacy vis-a-vis -vis the state, is surveillance. Uh, when, when Luigi is talking about uh, the right to be forgotten and data self-determination, uh, that is, and, and when Hans Jürger talks about data self-determination, those are the rights uh, that we have as consumers uh, to deal with the businesses that, that we deal with online. Yes. Um, for surveillance, though, there's a very different sort of thing. Who, who is being surveilled by the state? Is it everyone or is it certain people? And I'm, we can use the word criminals or we can use the word terrorists or we can use whatever, we can use the word bad guys uh, if we don't want to make any definitions. So I think we should keep all of those, uh, all of those concepts in mind. Um, now, sort of backing up a little bit even further, privacy uh, really is the groundwork upon which freedom is built. And I'm not, again, here I'm not talking about privacy against Google or against Facebook or against Twitter or WhatsApp. I'm talking about privacy against the state. Without our privacy, uh, we can't do the hard work that democracy and freedom demand. Um, when, uh, I, I said at the beginning that I took issue with, with the title of this, uh, of this panel that I don't believe cyber freedom and cyber security uh, are in opposition. And I don't just take issue with it because of the use of the word cyber, which is very 1999. Um, but uh, I, I think that if, if there is a dichotomy, it's between liberty and control. Uh, liberty and control cannot coexist. Freedom and security can. Great, this is a, um, uh, I mean, this is a great statement uh, do you want to comment on this? Yes, uh, on, on the point uh, that you say that privacy is different regarding uh, the private uh, sector on the one hand side and public sector on the one hand side. Uh, in, in a certain uh, dimension, yes. But the root, the root is the same. Yes. The root is, and there is, uh, for example, the uh, ruling of our constitutional court, the root is the dignity of man and the freedom of man, both together, and the right to uh, develop their own, its own, uh, her own um, personality. And in respect of these roots, dignity of man, uh, development of personality, freedom, uh, privacy is the same. I have the right uh, to dignity against uh, Google and Facebook in the same way as against uh, the state. And maybe, maybe uh, you can say there are, of course, um, things where the intrusion of private institutions is much more bigger than by the state. And uh, if, if, for example, uh, a, private, a private company 
uh, distributes data about diseases, for example, the harm for the concerned people can much be bigger than the collecting of billions of data by the NSA. So it's, uh, I would not agree that uh, the dangers coming from the state is bigger than from the company. They are different risks, that's right. It may be uh, in, the, in the processing itself, it's different if we have to uh, shelter privacy in the private sector and the public sector, but we have always to see the root is the same, the dignity, the personality of man. Okay, if, if yes, thank this, you. Go ahead, may, Luigi, please. Yes, on this point, I think, uh, that uh, this is a very important point, uh, and I would like to say a few words on what uh, Nate uh, also was saying. That is this. Today, there are certain internet providers that are more powerful than states. That's the reality. I disagree. The, in, the sense, in the sense that there are politicians that they are, they are, they are afraid of certain, because of the power that they have and the capacity to speak and address messages to their customers. Because when you have two billion customers, three billion customers, you are very powerful. Recently, one big company, I will not mention, has started to collect signature against one institution. So I think that in, maybe in the future, this, this will be an issue, can be an issue. I, I would yes. just, a, a very quick response to that. It's very rare that the sort of power that the private sector has when it collects your data is coercive power. It's usually persuasive power, and I think that's very, that's very different. When the state has your data, it is coercive power. Uh, the state can force you to act or not act by, the, by what it knows about you. Um, an internet company that has two billion subscribers can persuade people to act, but it can't force them to. And I think that's something worth keeping in mind. They're both, as, as Hans Jürger says, they're both risks. They're, they're both si significant problems, but they are, they're distinct in type. By the way, I don't see any difference between uh, coercive power and persuasive power. One has, one has the threat of violence behind it. And the other one has the power of blackmail behind it. So it's the same thing. Yes, I, I would, go ahead, I would, doctor. I would, also, <laughs> I would also disagree. There are also a big, big sectors in the private uh, area uh, where uh, the collecting of data, the processing of data is coercive. For example, think about banks. If you have a bank account, and you must have a bank account, or if you think about health insurance, maybe in USA they think different, but in Europe we think you must have any sort uh, of health insurance. You have no choice. Uh, it is coercive which data these institutions collect, which they want to have you from you, or for example, that's, that's a bit uh, perverse, uh, they force you to give them the consent to collect the data also from, from third sites. So that is coercive. So uh, the, the difference you make, uh, the private uh, sector is uh, persuasive, uh, the public sector, the state is coercive, that's not correct, at, at least not in any sector. There are sectors uh, where it's different. There are, by the way, also sectors in the state uh, which are persuasive. Yes, absolutely. You are not forced to, to visit a university or uh, educational institutions or other things, or cultural institutions. Uh, they also collect data about you. Uh, but, but, okay. but that is also persuasive. Though this, I don't see this difference uh, in the sharpness. Okay, uh, so Luigi, is, is Snowden a hero or a, a, a traitor? What is this? Snowden. But is what? he a hero or a traitor? I, I don't know. I really I don't know if he's a, a hero. <laughs> and uh, it, it's not up to me. I, I, don't, I don't know if he's a hero. I, I think that uh, uh, we. Uh, it's, it's important that, uh, you, you know that our company uh, uh, and in certain states, in order to get the, 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 the license, to get the permission, the authorization, we have to uh, respond to requests that we receive from, uh, uh, so in that, in that sense I agree with you, with the authority, so we cannot say no, we don't want to give you the information that you're asking, so we have a certain kind of, uh, of obligation and uh, 
obviously. Uh, I, don't I, think, I don't think they are hearing you. No, you have to speak no, loudly. Yes. I think that one, one issue that I would like to underline, if I may, because maybe we don't have a lot of time, is what we call in Europe, and this will affect also Lebanon, a level playing field. Because today, uh, what is happening in Europe? If I go on the net, on internet, I start to use internet, and I am a user, I don't know if the website, where the website that I'm consulting is. And even I don't care. So what we are trying to do in Europe with the new legislation, to give, to give a certain kind of right to all, to, to all the European consumers uh, and a certain level of protection, independently where is located the service provider that is offering uh, the service. This, what does it mean in practical terms? That, for example, if you are a Lebanese company and you collect information of European customers because you are selling on the net information of European partners, if this regulation will go through, also the Lebanese company and all the company, non-European company, will have to follow and the EU regulation. And this is something important that change, uh, uh, change the situation. Because as I was saying in the beginning, between Europe and US on privacy and data, data protection, there are differences. And uh, 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 also in what uh, the professor was saying, for example, in Europe, if we want to, if we want to send a message to a customer, we have to ask the permission. In the US, is not the case. So th there are differences. And what the new uh, regulation that we are discussing in Europe is trying to do is to level this uh, um, um, protection independently if you are a telecom operator or if you are on the top, and independently if you are based in Europe or if you are based outside Europe. OK. So I think we still have uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, to take some questions from the audience. Uh, I can see uh, two hands, three hands, three hands until now. OK, go ahead. OK, sorry. I have a question to Mr. Nate regarding uh, NSA. We know that NSA can force nowadays, and they did force Facebook, Google, and Apple, and Microsoft to give them data. And there were some type of agreement between Microsoft and uh, Facebook and whatever to force the NSA to let them give the list of names uh, the NSA did request data for. But basically, when I sign up, for example, with Google or Facebook account or Twitter account, I sign up with them, and I agree on terms and conditions and privacy setting and policy setting of Facebook, that does not include that they can give any data to any government all over the world about myself or about, about me. So we have two options. Either they have, for example, I can sue the NSA, for example, if they took my data because it was not in the deal I did and I signed with Facebook or Google or whatever. So where is the privacy here when we have you, have, you are taking my data without any prior, prior notice, without any agreement, and this is not included in the statement already signed with, between brackets statement, signed with Facebook or Google or whatever account. Um, you don't have privacy, and that is a significant problem. Uh, though, th what, what I'm doing about it is I am uh, part of an organization that is, in fact, suing the NSA over it. We would have sued Google as well, except in the United States, there's a law that gives Google and Facebook uh, immunity. From, from that kind of sharing. When, so something that Luigi said and something that you said just now, when the NSA goes to these companies and, and presents them with a court order, and it's a secret court uh, that says you must turn this over or we're gonna hold you in contempt and fine you and whatever, they, there, actually is, uh, they, there actually is an option that they have. Uh, a, a telecommunications company or an internet company or a social media company can either comply with the order and turn over your data or they can try and fight it. 
Uh, very few companies have tried to fight. LavaBit is the obvious big example, and they had to shut down rather because they lost their fight. Um, and actually, Yahoo is the other big example. And we didn't know about this until this year, until 2013. But in 2007, Yahoo challenged the NSA court order in the secret court that issued it uh, and said that they wouldn't turn over your data. So when, so when you say, where is my privacy, that's exactly right. Where is, where is your privacy? You didn't agree to those terms. You had no prior notice. It's not proportional. But it's also not true that the company had to comply. The company could have, and in my view, should have fought that order. And some companies do. And more companies should. OK, so okay. we have just a second. Yes. Uh, Go ahead, please. Um, I just want to ask about Snowden. I mean, I think it's a very hot topic at the moment. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, Mr. Snowden was working in, in some government office, and uh, he obviously, you know, thought that this uh, information was not suitable to his value, probably, and probably he thought he can be a, a hero by sneaking it out. Now, I think you know, a lot of people are with him, and I thought in uh, Forbes magazine, they were, they were nominating him to, to, be, to be the best man in the world. And I think you know, this is something unusual, and I think I'm against it. Because even if the government is doing wrong, I mean, I'm a school principal, and we have certain values in the school with certain secrets. And you know, these people that we employ, are we trust them that they are supposed to keep this data for themselves. And they should know that they are with this school. I'm not saying that to be totally illegal, but I'm saying you know you have a different point of view than the organization. But I'm sure that since you are employed with this own organization, you're supposed to keep that secret. So I want to know like your clear um, opinion about this as a lawyer. Would you, for example, um, defend him in court? Thank you. Um. So my organization depends on some of the information that Snowden provided. Uh, so I couldn't, it would be a conflict of interest for me personally to defend Snowden in court. Um, I think it's not, there's no debate that what Snowden did was a crime. It was. Uh, that cannot be disputed. I don't think it can be disputed uh, rationally that what he did was good for the United States and good for the world either. I think it was. Uh, we are having this discussion here today in large part thanks to Edward Snowden and thanks to the, the documents that he brought out and the news stories that came out of it. So what he did, number one, was a crime. Number two, I am deeply thankful for, and I think we all should be. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's, that's civil disobedience. When Gandhi walked to, to the sea or when Martin mm -hmm. Luther King walked to, to Birmingham, those were crimes as well. OK. Yeah. Professor, short yeah. comment. I'm absolutely uh, your opinion. And your question was, was he, is he a hero or is he a traitor? Both. 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 We have thousands of examples in the history where the traitors were the real heroes. But uh, the matter is a different one. We should not personalize th this problem. But what we have to see is uh, that it was a big progress that the data he uh, gave, he informed about, uh, were now in the public, uh, in the public, and we can discuss public about domain. that. There's a big progress for freedom, I would say, in the world. And the problem is not the personalization of uh, Mr. Snowden. Yep. Okay, Rassan, please. Just a quick intervention because this panel is, is, is such a great, uh, is giving such a great debate and highlighting a very, very important point. And that, well, two important points. One of them is how you eccentric the internet is, still is at its infancy and development because most of these issues we're talking about exist for one major reason is that a lot of the world data actually resides in the US today because of the dominance of the US companies in the internet world, as we can see from this big circle. Name me one non-US company in this circle, probably. It's going to be difficult, probably well, Canadian, black, black, North black, American, black, black, North American, only black, black. Uh, about to disappear. And, <laughs> and <laughs> the, other, the, the, the other important point that you just made, uh, 
Nate, is, is quite interesting. You mentioned that Yahoo took over, you know, challenged basically the NSA. Yep. Uh, it's, it's also interesting to see where Yahoo is to that challenge in 2007. Um, so the, the idea is Europe is having this debate about personal data and privacy. Um, yet Europe is not attracting enough hosting and companies on the internet to abide by European laws. Most startups are happening in the US, growth is happening in the US in this field, and then Europe is catching up to that, trying to legislate and help attract investments and growth in this field. So, as we mentioned earlier today, do you believe that as the internet grows, as more investments go into that area, and as Luigi mentioned, as more money is actually being made um, uh, in, in, in this area on, on data, etc. Will there be a shift from a US-centric internet model to a truly global internet model where the actual engines of the internet start residing in different markets, abiding by different laws in a large enough scale that will allow this kind of European viewpoint versus US viewpoint to be settled into somewhere in between and then the internet reaches a certain level of maturity in terms of data security and data and privacy uh, that will, will, will keep everyone quite happy. So Luigi, would you like? Yes, uh, thanks a lot for this question because uh, uh, it's very important and very interesting. Europe is not a country. <laughs> Uh, it's not like US. So what uh, what is missing in Europe? And what 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 is the challenge that we have in front to create one single market to integrate the digital, the telecom market in Europe? Today we have 28 regulators of privacy, and one of the change that is in the proposal. Think about if you if you uh, um, start to to have services in Europe. You have 28 different legislation because one of the problems that we have in Europe that yes, we have the same, the same rules, but then these rules are implemented at a national level in a different way. So, and these are, and if Europe will be capable to create one market, because in Europe we have 500 million people, Europe is the biggest market in the world, remain the biggest market in the world. The problem is such kind of fragmentation that we have for, for the fact that we have 28 member states, we have many national regulators. Today, Apple, for example, in Europe, has 28 stores. They, can, they don't have European Apple stores because they cannot. And I, I always say that, uh, I always make this example. If you want, for example, if you produce this glass and you want to sell it to the US, Miami or in a city, and you, you, you open an office and you sell it all over the US. If you want to sell in Europe, you have to, if you have to open 28 offices, and maybe that one country will say you that the glass should be red, should be white, should be yellow, should be smaller, should be bigger. So that's the problem. And we need scale. We need economy of scale. We need a mark. And when we have a bigger market, and for this reason, we are also discussing a common strategy of, on cloud services, because we feel that it will be very important. To, uh, uh, maybe that Europe could, uh, uh, could uh, do better and uh, lead again. OK, thank you very much, Luigi. I will take one more question and a last round of tweets from the panel. Mireille Ael, World Vision Lebanon. Uh, in regard to cybersecurity and cyber freedom, we've been discussing the technicality and uh, the intrusion of like uh, uh, intervening in the cybersecurity of individual and organization. I would like to take it from another point of view, the meaning behind investigating this problematic. As I come from a um, World Vision International community-based organization, we deal a lot with community mobilization, with peace building, and we grab lots of our projects based on assessments and data, whether like face-to-face, -face, secondary data, or cybernet. So the type of data shared in this cybersecurity or cyber freedom 
could give us an insight about the level and the type of intervention with the people that we need to deal with. So I would like to have like a meaning behind this cybersecurity and the cyber freedom to have a target assistance and to see it from a positive side rather than just dwelling on the technicalities of it. Thank you. Who wants to answer this big, huge question? That you? That Luigi? The professor. <laughs> you don't want to answer this? I, uh, to be honest, I did not understand correctly. <laughs> it, was, it was a very complex question. No one wants way. to answer. Maybe you can repeat. Uh, Let will, me clarify. Who, who, yeah, who would can decide? Just, yes. Uh, who would decide? Who would decide that we have a cybersecurity and cyber freedom, and how we use this data? Is it the government? Is it the citizens? Is it the NGOs? Or who is it? It's all of us. Yes. yes. We have to work together. Yeah. All nations, all institutions, citizens, customers, and, so all, and NGOs. Of course. It is. It is actually the uh, uh, the endeavor today about those matters uh, are, are, is taken by multi-stakeholders groups. So it is the NGOs, it is the governments, it is the uh, private sector, and all those organizations are meeting all over the world in different forums to uh, find out one single way to deal with those issues. So there is no one party that will uh, ever deal with this issue. Okay, one last comment from you guys. I will come back to your first uh, remark. There is, uh, in regard of our item here, there is no contradiction uh, between uh, freedom uh, on the one hand side and security on the other side. And I want to recall a sentence, maybe you know that, of Benjamin Franklin, one of the fathers of the American Constitution, the first constitution in the world uh, who had human rights as uh, its uh, main Topic. He said in the year 16, uh, 1755, 1755, they who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Interesting. <laughs> Nate, your last tweet. My last tweet. Well, I, I don't have the quote in front of me, so I'm sure I won't get the exact words right. Uh, but Mandela said that we cannot truly have freedom until we work for the freedom of others. And I think that's all of our jobs in this room. Uh, and we don't have, as, as Benjamin Franklin said, uh, we don't have to trade our security to do it. Yes, great. <laughs> Luigi. Uh, my, my, my tweet is uh, we need to, to uh, find the right balance, as I said between uh, protection of consumer and innovation. Because what is needed and what we need he, in Europe, and I think also here, is innovation. How important is for our government's innovation? How important is from our government internet? Sometimes we criticize or we say US, but at least we have to recognize that the US government has a vision. And if you speak with a US ambassador, in his agenda, internet is the number one. Where is, it? Where is it in the agenda on, of our countries, of our ambassadors? And that's, I think, uh, it's important for us. And so I would encourage everybody, this is, this is our, our country. And this is a Facebook post. It's not uh, okay. Twitter. You're right. Tweet. <laughs> okay, but uh, so but <laughs> because I made uh, many tweets. <laughs> OK. Thank you, Luigi. OK, so uh, my, my personal last tweet is, Power to the people, thank you. <laughs>